Hi, friends, and welcome to another episode of That Sounds Fun. I'm your host, Annie F. Downs. I'm so happy to be with you here today. Man, I'm loving these Monday episodes. But before we dive into today's conversation, I want to tell you about one of our incredible sponsors, AG1. It's important to me that any supplements I take are of the highest quality, and that's why for so many years I've been drinking AG1. Quality really is their commitment, and it's backed by their expert-led scientific research, high-quality ingredients, industry-leading manufacturing, and lots of testing. At each step of the process, they really go above and beyond industry standards. I know I can trust what is in every scoop because they obsess over their practices and their ingredients, and they are heavily researched. AG1 takes care of my health by covering my my nutritional bases and setting me up for success in just 60 seconds, making it so there aren't like a million different pills and capsules to keep track of. Just one scoop of AG1 mixed in really cold water every day. I also love that it includes vitamin C and zinc to support my immune system. If you want to replace your multivitamin and more, start with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first subscription at drinkag1.com slash sounds fun. That's drinkag1.com slash sounds fun. Y'all check it out. Okay, today we are jumping into the book of Mark with Dr. Esau McCauley as we continue our Let's Read the Gospels series. So if you missed last Monday with Bethany Allen talking about Luke, or you missed our first episode of the series with Dr. Nijay Gupta talking about John, go back and listen to those. We will link them in the show notes below. Dr. Esau McCauley is an award-winning author and associate professor of New Testament at Wheaton College. He also joined us back on episode 485, if you want to hear that. So when we were thinking thinking about who we wanted to talk about the book of Mark with. Well, I didn't know Luke was his favorite, but I am thrilled at all he knows about the book of Mark. So as we've been doing in every episode, before we dive in, I want to give you an overview of the book of Mark so you can kind of wrap your head around the context of this book. Again, I'm using my personal quest study Bible that asks some important questions at the beginning, and I'll just read those to you and the answers. Why read this book? All news radio stations give you highlights of all the news in the world in 30 minutes or less. The Gospel of Mark follows a similar fast-paced approach while introducing Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Readers see highlights of the ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Coming out of obscurity, this unique God-man preaches, performs miracles, and encounters both great popularity and deadly opposition. It's the greatest news story of all time. Who wrote this book? John Mark, the son of a Jerusalem widow whose home was a meeting place for early believers. We know that from Acts 12.12. 12. Mark most likely recorded the events as he heard them firsthand from the disciple Peter. When was it written? Possibly as early as A.D. 50. Others place it around A.D. 65, closer to the time Peter was executed, but before Jerusalem was destroyed by Roman armies in A.D. 70. To whom was it written? This book's distinctly non-Jewish flavor suggests it may have been written to believers in Rome. Why was it written? The Roman Empire, the dominant world power, had begun to persecute Christians. Mark wanted to encourage suffering believers. He showed Jesus as the suffering servant who came to die. He also portrayed him as the savior of the entire world, including Romans as well as Jews. What to look for in Mark? The humanity of Jesus who was both the Son of God and the Son of Man. Watch for the emotional impact of this action-packed gospel. More than 40% of Mark focuses on the suffering and sacrifice of Christ's final week on earth. So here is my conversation where we deep dive about the book of Mark with my friend and one of my favorite theologians and professors, Dr. Esau McCauley. That sounds fun. Esau McCauley, welcome back to That Sounds Fun. Thank you so much for having me. Well, listen, we're going to tell everybody the whole truth. You are being the most generous because you're on sabbatical and you're in England and you still are cutting out some time for us to chop it up about the Book of Mark. I'm so grateful. And I just got out of off a train from St. Andrews, well, yeah, from from Scotland all the way back to Oxford. It was was a long day. So if I forget half of Mark today... Um, I'm sorry. Mark's too short. You can't forget half of it. It's too short of a book start from the get-go. I know how it ends, though. I know how it ends. (laughs) 
That's how I feel when I watch The Chosen. I'm like, well, at least I know how this thing's going to end because this is stressful right now. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. I think hey, I'm the only person much- in America who hasn't seen The Chosen. Don't don't judge me, Internet. I'm only slightly judging you. Are you choosing not to watch it because of your profession or have you just not gotten to it? You know, in my old age, I just don't watch very much. T- I'm lame. I'm washed. No, I watch you read very books, little television. You? So, yeah. or I, yeah, I listen to audio books when I don't want to read. So I just haven't, yeah. I can't remember. Yeah. So I, I, maybe I need to, to jump into it at some point. I think I've seen like 15 minutes of the first episode. Jesus hadn't showed up yet. So that's where I'm at. <laughs> You're like, I'm out. <laughs> He's not I didn't say this. I was out. I'm just saying like, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't picked it back up yet. Um, okay. Whatever you want to tell, will you tell us what you, you and your family are doing in England? Yeah, so I'm on sabbatical. I am um, living in a place called Yarnton Manor. That's going to be kind of a research library area. So that's where we are now. And I'm a visiting scholar at Wycliffe College. It's a college or hall of Oxford. So I'm here. I'm doing research. I'm working on. A, I'm, I'm working on a commentary on Colossians and Philemon. God willing, I'll finish that by the end of 2024. And I'm also at the beginning stages of a book on the Bible and slavery. Ooh. Uh, that, 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 I'm not supposed to talk about that yet, but okay. <laughs> maybe by the time the podcast comes out, it'll, it, people will know about it. But yeah, I'm working on a book. My my follow a follow. My next book is going to be about the Bible and slavery. So I've been working on that as well. I don't know if you know this, but I'm in one movie in my whole life called Surprised by Oxford that is set okay. at Oxford University. <laughs> there we go. So my I'm, only I, IMDb <laughs> is Oxford University. <laughs> I don't. I've never been. In, you got more INDBs than I got because I haven't been yeah. in anything. If, if any uh, directors like are out listening to the podcast, I got some acting skills. That's right. You're ready. Get, just get I'm a ready. Phone I'm, call. If you stay ready, you don't got to get ready. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> oh, okay, so as um, we gave you the heads up, we are doing a whole series this month on the Gospels, and just kind of yeah. as we're going through the Let's Read the Gospels guided journal, as we're doing our actual last round of Let's Read the Gospels on the podcast, and then we're doing the Book of Acts, and then we're retiring it for a season. We are doing each book, and I was like, "Can we please get Esau to come and talk to us about the Book of Mark?" I, will you just oh. start? I, yeah, I'm just, I'm dying to hear you talk about Mark. You are exactly who I wanted to talk about Mark with. This is an interesting thing to think about because to keep it in 100, my favorite gospel is actually Luke, um, which is why really? my oldest son is named Luke. But I love uh, Mark too. Like, like they're like all four of your kids. Yeah. But, um, yeah, yeah, Luke, yeah. The gospel Luke is favorite. I teach Mark in the gospels in my introduction to New Testament class. So I want to talk about that part at least because I, I, each gospel approaches the story of Jesus differently. And one of the things that I say to my students is that shows you that you can be faithful and come at the story from different ways. And that means that it teaches us how to have different tools in our toolkit. And so something like Matthew, I know you don't want to compare all of it, but something like Matthew is pretty didactic, right? This happened to fulfill the scriptures. And so Matthew has these huge kind of chunks of scripture and he kind of methodically walks you through. Here's why Jesus is the second Moses and, you know, the, 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 the hope of Israel. Mark is different. And I tell people in some sense, it's a little bit easier rhetorically to be Matthew. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. And then I show you all through the book uh-huh. and then it ends with proving what I showed you. Mark is almost the most dangerous kind of preaching where you have to have the person follow the narrative all the way through and then the revelation is at the end. Because if you don't, uh, right, if you preach like that, if you if you preach the way that Mark tells the story, you have to keep the people all the way through. And then at the end, he goes, truly, this was the son of God. And so what Mark is, is a narrative rooted in suspense and, and plot development rather than um, something like Matthew. I'm just using Matthew as an example. Yeah, or yeah, even yeah. John. In the beginning was the word and where we came flesh. And you kind of go through with the seven, seven signs. And so yeah. I think that one thing that makes Mark unique is the narrative tension. And what Mark does in narrative tension kind of becomes paradigmatic for how we understand the story of Jesus. He begins his ministry. There is initial popularity. People love him, right? And then after a while, there is uh, the people turn on him. And then the question becomes, you know, who do you think the son of man is? Then there's the confession. And and immediately following the confession, you have the son of man will suffer many things and be crucified. And then you kind of have the story leading to the passion. And so that narrative that we think of is just the Jesus story, right? Because they mark what the first gospel written. What we think of is the, the frame of the Jesus narrative. Initial success, rising tension, confession, mm. prophecies about death, crucifixion, 
is is a, it's a narrative that requires you to pay attention, right? It's a it's a narrative that requires you to to go bit by bit versus something like. And this is not to shade Matthew. Here's the genealogy. Mm-hmm. Here's the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus just sits down and teaches for like chapters after chapters. There's no Sermon on the Mount in Mark, right? Mm-hmm. The Mark just mm-hmm. comes and Jesus is just rushing through this whole thing uh-huh. on the way to his appointed task, which is yes. the passion and resurrection. So I can say a lot more about Mark. I'm going to try to reel myself in because there is, it's such a rich text. It's probably what I would say. Listen, you always have permission with us to never reel okay. yourself in. I am having okay. a great I'll say, I'll, time I'll say already. one more thing. I'll, I'll, okay, I'll, say, I'll, say, I'll say one more thing. The one of the other things about Mark is one of the amazing things about the narrative, which I think draws people in, is because there's a real sense in which Jesus's discussion with the disciples periodically breaks the third wall. In other words, there, there are often these moments where he's talking to the disciples, but he's also clearly talking to the audience. And so yeah. you have something like when, when, when you read through the first part of Mark and you come to the question that Jesus poses to the disciples, who do you say the son of man is? Yeah. And so you go on, wait, hold on. You, you as the reader are going, well, hold on. Who is he? Yeah. And then they go through yeah. the options. And you kind of go, like, you you know that those answers that are given, one of the prophets, like, we know that that's not right. Yeah, yeah, and that's, it's, right. And that's it's right. And it's hard, it's hard for us because on one hand, no one comes to the gospel, very few people come to the gospel of Mark not knowing its conclusion. Yeah. Right? There's passion and resurrection. But when when Peter goes, you're the Messiah, you're the son of God, we're like, yes, this is this is it. You got it. Good job, Peter. <laughs> and then immediately, immediately at that moment where, where he he makes the confession, Jesus unsettles them again. You don't understand what it means for me to be the Messiah. Yeah. That part yeah. of Messiahship is not just the ministry of glory, but it's also the ministry of passion and resurrection. Yeah. And so a narrative that sets you up to confess one thing, you are the king of Israel, the hope of the world. Even when you come to that point, right, you're then upset again. And you have to begin to accept the ministry or the messiahship of Jesus as one that involves suffering and death and on the other side of that resurrection. And if you wait, if you ask me later when we get to the to the to the passion and the resurrection, we'll talk about the women at the empty tomb. But I'll I will I will okay. at least not I write it down. I write now. it down so I don't miss it. Yes. Um, Ask me about the women at the empty tomb. Okay. For our friends listening, I've got a piece of paper. I got a pen. I got my Bible open. I am like, I'm here <laughs> for this Bible study. I am here I, for I got, it. I got to open it up. I got to open it up too. Cause I said, cause when, when, when it gets late at night, all of the gospels run together. So I got to make sure yeah. I'm talking about Mark. Go ahead. No, no, no. You're doing great. Okay. But tell us, I mean, one of the things that is complicated for me, Matthew and John were there. Mark and Luke yeah. are not disciples. So who yes. is Mark and how did he get all these up close? Like, how did he overhear yeah. Jesus talking? So one of the interesting things is we all assume that Mark was the first gospel and that, yes. that Mark was first and that Matthew and then Luke were following and depending on the order. But tradition has it that, that the Mark is John Mark. So I'll tell you some stuff that probably isn't true. And then we could talk about what is true, but this might not right. be true, but it's at least cool, right? This is just, yeah. this is completely, I think there's That's like two scholars who still believe it, but it's kind of, it preaches, right? So yeah. the first thing is that John Mark uh, is the John Mark that who we encounter in the book of Acts who travels okay. with Paul and Barnabas and, yes. and there's the, the breakup. So that and guy. the reason they break so up. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, the reason they break up. So interestingly enough, his his own story is like the best rags to riches story in the Bible. I think this is yeah. the, the correct mark. So I'm going to say this part. So John Mark initially travels in ministry with Paul and Barnabas. And at a certain point, ministry gets difficult. John Mark runs away or he goes back and something happens and he leaves. They get ready to go on the second missionary trip. And Paul's like, I'm not kicking with this dude no more. Right. <laughs> like, I'm right. not going with him. And I can imagine Barnabas being like, what do you mean you can't forgive this dude? Nobody used to like you, Paul. You used to kill people. And we gave you a second chance. But anyways, Paul Listen, and you, Barnabas. Listen, do you know how I feel so- about Paul? <laughs> I roll yeah. my eyes about Paul all the time. So I'm like, Paul, I love Paul, right. but he's just a tough hang. He's like an intense yeah. dude. He's a good intense <laughs> dude. He, he directs his intensity towards God. So that was good. So Paul and Silas go one way 
and John Mark and Barnabas go the other way. But the other thing that we encounter, though, is that later on at the end of Paul's life, I think it's in the pastoral epistles, he actually speaks about the reconciliation that he has with John Mark. So at some point, oh. even Paul goes, this John Mark character is someone who can be trustworthy. Now, the church wow. tradition is, is that this John, so like you can have a failure in your ministry. I'm going to preach the historical background. You can have yes. a failure in your ministry where that's not the end of your story. So that's even though right. John Mark, at one point, it runs away as a coward, tradition has that he kind of returns. Now, how does this John Mark end up being the Mark who writes the gospel? Well, the idea was that he was a traveling, he ended up being a traveling companion with Peter. He was a translator for Peter when Peter went around because he knew the, he knew the language and Peter didn't. And so the idea is that Mark's gospel has actually been known as the memoirs of Peter. This is Peter's account of the gospel narrative. And is that still what you think is true? That is what you think is true? Here's the reason. This is the reason why I think there's a strong historical case for it. One is, why would Mark, why would Matthew and Luke shape their gospel around Mark unless it has significant cachet in early Christianity? Like right. why might they why might right. they do that? I think a reason why they might do that is they kind of go, well, this is this is Peter's version. And so that yep. means the narrative shape of the gospel is strongly influenced by how Peter tells his story through wow. John Mark. Wow, okay, okay. And so, and so then you begin to ask yourself, and this is, once again, I like to tell people when this is complete conjecture. This last part is complete Esau conjecture. I could be wrong. Okay. You might want to ask yourself this question, Annie. Who has the cachet in the early church? Who has the sauce, you might say? Yeah. You say, you know what? I like Peter, but I'm going to tell my own story. And that's actually John, the son of Zebedee. He's the and only John one who kind of goes, yeah. you like, like John's like, you know, and John's old at this point. It's like, you know what? I'm old. I'm good. I'm going to tell it this way. And so yeah. I think that the association of Mark's gospel with Peter early on solidifies that as the central part of the Jesus tradition, which is why Matthew and Luke are then formulated kind of along those same patterns. And so I don't think, I don't think that we have a better candidate than John Mark. Um, being influenced by Peter. And, and the idea that someone like Peter would have a way of telling the Jesus story, I think we have a pretty strong evidence to suggest that, of course, Peter went around preaching about Jesus. Yeah. Now, the other thing that I want to say as it relates to that is, what do we actually have when we look at these gospel narratives? What we actually have is the story in the shape of Mark's gospel with different variations in Matthew and Luke. We talk about the synoptics today. And so in, in, in John and Mark, you have people like Jesus. People get mad at Jesus. Peter confesses Jesus as the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, I'm going to die and rise in the resurrection. That historical narrative seems like pretty plausible on its face, yeah. right? Yeah. Would you have someone who has an initial positive response? from the people because of his miracles and his teachings about the concern for the disinherited, right? Wow. And this idea of the kingdom of God is coming in and through my ministry. Of course, people are yeah. going to love him. Yeah. But you know who's not going to love him? The people who have who are in power who might be threatened by his ascension. Right. Or by the way that he handles, the way, the way they understand how he handles the law. I don't believe that Jesus ever breaks the law. I think Jesus keeps the Torah. He just yes. has his particular way of in engaging the Torah. So the idea that Jesus had a popular ministry that ran into conflicts with the religious authorities, that he's then handed over to Pilate, that Pilate thinks it's politically pragmatic to kill him, feels like, to me, there's nothing historically implausible about it. And what you then have is narrating this story in such a way that this general plot line kind of comes to fruition, yeah. which is what you then see in Matthew and then in Luke, and then its own way in John. But we'll leave we'll leave John off to the side. So I think that there is good evidence to, to believe that Mark, um, at an early, early stage, um, was associated with Peter, and that the uh -huh. association between Mark and Peter led to the other gospel writers kind of taking that shape and maybe or maybe the reason that peter told that story is that's kind of how so this all right this is nerdy part okay can i this, this I, is I, am, part. I i i could yeah. bathe in this i'm having the best time here's another question writers think about this are all stories basically the same right or is there um so, so is there a universal story like what yeah. we consider a plot or is it something that, that, that is influenced by the way that we tell stories in the West? So if you look at okay. certain parts of like um, certain Asian cultures, their the shape of some of the narratives and the plot devices are a little bit different than what we have in the West. So it could be that because 
Um, Mark is a part of the Greco Roman Empire, that we're kind of heirs of the Greco Roman Empire, that we just see this story as a natural way of telling stories. But the idea of beginning, rising tension, climactic confession, mm -hmm. you know, betrayal, fault, and like climactic. So that yeah. narrative, that narrative shape is either just how we tell stories as humans, right? Is, is Mark telling his story because this is how we tell stories. Things yes. are good. There's a, a complicated part of the narrative, betrayal, death, resurrection, or is that actually how it happened? And I think that there's no reason to doubt the, the structure of Mark's gospel, which is Jesus came, taught some things, did some miracles, got a following that someone who was close to him became disillusioned within that context, betrayed him leading to his death. And then the, the plot twist on the plot twist is the, the, the idea of the resurrection or the, or the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. That wow. would be something that obviously is not in all narratives. It's kind of a, it's a uniquely wow. Christian thing. So I anyways, mean, that's a little bit of an overflow in some historical background in Mark. You are blowing my mind right now. I'm in New York, so I don't have my mind blown emoji button, but I am pushing it in my mind. He's <laughs> yeah, oh, you, my you're, mind. You're, you're in NYC. I love I, I yes. love New York. That's what that's becoming oh. one of my favorite cities. When I first it came as a southerner, I wasn't ready for it. But uh -huh. now I've been there a couple of times and it's slowed down. Yeah. And now I'm beginning to appreciate it for, for the wonderful place that it is. I think you've got to be in the right part of New York. That's right. That is 100% right. Um, yes. Okay, so there are two stories that I've heard scuttle about okay, as scuttle far as Mark. Streets. Yes, scuttle okay. in the streets. Number one, is Mark the rich young ruler he writes about? I mean, so this is one of the things that I talked about in Mark's gospel. People have gone and tried to find Mark in the narrative. That's, yeah, the, part, yeah, that's yeah. the part that I never came back to. The thing that isn't true. That probably isn't oh, true. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, probably, is, so that's what I said. These are stuff, both my stuff, questions. Yeah. Yeah. So probably isn't true. So some people have said that he's the rich young ruler. Other people have said, and I like this one just because it's funny. And it kind Me of, too. it creates a, a narrative arc is that in the gospel of Mark, there is the, the, the person who, when Jesus is betrayed, the they kind of grab guy. his cloak and he runs away naked. And it's yeah. like, look, he's been running. You know, he, you know, he's, he's a runner. He's a track star. He's been running like, most of his life, right? So he uh -huh. runs in Mark's gospel. He runs with um, Paul. Uh -huh. And then eventually at the end of his life, he kind of has courage and he stays and ministers oh, wow. alongside Peter. So even what I said about the relationship between Peter and, and Mark, it doesn't, you can't prove it. Yeah. But I think that the historical, the historical plausibility of the influence of Mark's gospel. Because like, why, why do I got to listen to you? Why don't I just listen to somebody else? Mm -hmm. And so I do think that, um, that those, that those stories and what he told those stories were in some sense definitive in, in early Christianity. I like the idea of him writing himself into the book only because, yeah. you know, as he's sitting and talking to yes. Peter, he's scribing down what Peter said. And then Peter says, well, what about? What about when you and Jesus had that conversation? Yeah, well, yeah like, you laughing at me because I. But what about yeah. when you ran off naked? When you ran off naked, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wish, I, I wish we had some evidence of it. I know. And so when I communicate things to people about the Bible and the Scripture, I do think there's some um, requirement that we had to have some discipline. Yes. And so I will say to you, just like I said in earlier, like I can't prove this. I find it interesting. Yes. And so I think that it's okay to. Uh, to get at the limits of what we can say. What we can say is that early on, Christians saw in the gospel of Mark something that was true about the story of Jesus. This, this might be wild to you, Annie, but some okay. people don't read their Bibles, right? And we're not going to judge them. They don't read their Bibles, but they actually go to church a lot, right? So if they just go to church a lot, they've heard their pastors preach. So they kind of have a basic idea of what's in the Bible, right? So someone pulls up in their church and say, and then Jesus flew across the, the Sea of Galilee instead of walked on water. People are like, no, 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 no. That's not in the Bible. Right. So right. in other words, there's kind of an implicit, basic understanding of the structure of the, the Christian narrative just by yes. being in church week in and week out. Mm -hmm. And so what you have then, if you can imagine traveling apostles who told stories about Jesus and evangelists over and over and over again, even without a Bible, even without like a written text. You had a basic understanding of the elements of the Jesus story. Yeah. 
And so, so when someone came into your community talking wild, like this doesn't seem like what Jesus would do, the or apostolic tradition, in some sense, was a check on the written tradition. And so, when the churches received Mark's gospel and they open it, that was the story that they knew. There, there was a sense of, of kinship ah. and rec- recognition. And I think that that recognition seems to be immediate and it seems to be formative. Now, is it possible or even likely that one of the things that was that was pushing along that early acceptance of it was its association with Peter? I think I think there's a reason right. for it. Because we talk about right. we talk we talk about non-canonical gospels and there's gospels that were written that were not originally included in what became the canon. But you don't actually see, unless you want to say the record was totally erased, even though they were, they wasn't like the Christian police. They were just floating around arguing about stuff, sending letters. It seems that the fourfold gospel pretty early on became these were the gospels and that wow. these, these stories had a, a, an early impact. And it seems pretty clear to me that if you read, um, what becomes the non-canonical gospels, that they're clearly in dialogue. They're kind of remixes of what become the four gospels, right? So if you read them, oh, wow. you can kind of tell that they're engaging and reinterpreting, um, the, what, what becomes the gospel narrative. So you'll see, like, I think it's in the gospel of Mary Magdalene where, It'll be parts of what looks like a retelling of what's in the Gospels. And then Jesus will turn over or the Gospel of somebody else on this mayor. And, and he'll whisper something secret like, oh, this wasn't in the Gospels because Jesus whispered it to this person. And that's how they managed to expand upon what is the core tradition. And so it seems to me that um, that, that Mark is a part of the apostolic deposit in this association with John, Mark, and Peter is the good explanation as any. Okay, this is so good. Right, so do you recommend us reading the non-canonical f- pieces like the Gospel of Mary Magdalene or are those like, is it like Not stay really. away or read them? I mean, I don't know if we read enough of the regular Bible to be getting the extra Bible. I mean, like not hey, extra Bible, extra text. Hey. So I'm not, saying, I'm not saying, I'm saying I've been keeping like, 100, right? Annie, till you're done with the real one. When you're done with the yeah, real no. one, Annie, call me. So yeah. <laughs> I think if, if I was going, if I was going to recommend, it's, and by the way, it's not because I'm a, I think that if you read them, you'll clearly see the difference between the texts. It's not like, oh, you'll be exposed to ideas. I don't think that, you know, the, the angels tell the Christians do not be afraid for a reason. Like we don't, we're not yeah. afraid that, you know, yeah. truth has its own, truth is his own advocate. So I'm not afraid of yes. it. But if I was trying to enrich my understanding of early Christianity rather than, cause most of the non-canonical gospels are later. I would actually go before and read something like the mm-hmm. Pseudepigrapha. In other words, I think you're better off understanding how early Christians thought and moved and behaved by looking at the, the Jewish people of the time period from which early Christianity arose. Oh, so cool. you All might, right. you might be better served if you only have a few, if, if you kind of, I know the gospels. I would go and read like some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I would go and read, um, something like First and Second Maccabees. And so you begin to understand. So one, one of them, for example, would be something like the Psalms of Solomon, where you see a, an account of a guy who's called the Davidic Messiah. You see him. Okay. You talk about a guy who's going to be yep. the coming king of Israel. And that Messiah, judges the nations and he like kills the um the gentiles and kicks them out of jerusalem and judea and that the the gentiles are blessed through being subservient to the reigning davidic king who establishes like his kingdom through the sword and so that's only one account right but reading about the description of that kind of messiah at least gives you a dialogue to say like oh that's the kind of guy who might be recognizable and then when you see the gospel oh, wow. of, of, um, the gospel accounts, right? So for example, John is like, Hey man, like you're the Messiah. But then John gets arrested and John is like, well, are you the one who's to come? What should we look for another? Yes. Well, why yes. is John, why is John disappointed in the ministry of Jesus? Because John had a different understanding of what a Messiah might look like. And how might you get an understanding of what a Messiah might look like by looking at Messianic accounts of the first century? And so it's not that I'm saying you shouldn't read these gospel accounts. But what you see in some of the later um gospels, you see, in some sense, Christian debate around how to make sense of Jesus. Got and it. like other kinds of accounts of it. And so I'm not saying that they're not useful. I'm saying that as a, as a, um, 
as a scholar, first of all, I would love it if people just read the Bible. So, but for the five of y'all who say I got the New Testament down, I got the Old Testament down, and I just need more sauce, then you can go run into the pseudepigrapha <laughs> and the apocrypha okay. and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay. And, and Josephus and Philo. That's you, okay? every, everybody's, I mean, I do own the Josephus book. I mean, I'm go. not done reading the I Bible. Mean, I own, <laughs> Yeah. But I do own the Josephus book because I yeah. do like that he was uh, parallel timing wise. Yeah. I just think that's real. That's I thought it. that was so I, I mean, I've read them, but once again, I'm probably going to have gospel people yell at me, the gospel scholars. I'm a Paul person. Uh-huh. And us, the, the Paul people love that stuff. So maybe it could be the fact that I'm influenced by the stuff that I, that I, that I, that I yeah. encounter, engage most as the Paul. So like the, the, the extra canonical gospels, to be honest, hasn't been historical, a, a strong part of my scholarship. Yeah. And I'm also per- persuaded. So I'm just going to footnote some people so I can be nerdy in case they ever, like there's a guy named Mark Goodacre who, who, who kind of argues that most of these gospels are later than, um, the the synoptics, even though some of them might have early elements, um, things to kind of go back to the time of Jesus, yeah. most of them are are later. Are later. Okay, so yeah. we'll stick with our four for now. I mean, you can do what you want to do. I'm just saying, like, <laughs> I would like, read, read the, the Bible, I would read guys. the pseudepigrapha. Read the Bible <laughs> and get a get a decent um, commentary, a dictionary, yeah, and 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 go to work that way. A, a good yeah. encyclopedia. Like those are the tools that'll get you pretty far. So speaking of this this category of things, the book of Mark ends and the end of my Bible says the earliest manuscripts and some other yeah. ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, yeah. 9 through 20. Yeah. Why does that happen yeah. sometimes? It happens here. It happens once in another gospel. But why does Mark end differently? People get really, really worked up about this. I think in the entirety of the New Testament, this only happens like two or three times where we're pretty clear that this was not a part of um, the early tradition. Okay. So as it relates to the gospel of Mark, if you turn to the very end of it, and one of the cool things to do, if you if you, if you have nothing else to do, but it's like, if you were, <laughs> I don't know how you could do this, but you could. If you had like a Bible from like 40 years ago, and then a Bible uh-huh. from like 20 years ago, and a Bible from like 10 years ago, the, the distance between Mark 16, 8, and nine to twenty just grows over time. Oh, <laughs> right? wow. At first, there's yeah. a, a there's like a little bit of a gap, and then there's like a big gap, and now there's usually brackets. It's like over yeah. time, we're becoming more and more clear about explaining this to you. Yeah, so that's right. the simple issue is that the earliest manuscripts of Mark's gospel end with verse eight. Okay. Now, the interesting thing about verse eight is in the Greek. So if you look at, I'm gonna turn to uh, Mark, and these are the women um, at the empty tomb, which is what you wanted to talk yes. about. Yes. It says, this is how Mark Mark's gospel ends in the manuscripts that we have. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Yeah. Now, the tricky part is, um, if you have the Greek text, the final word, in, it's, in English, it seems much smoother than it does in Greek. In English, the final, in Greek, the final word is... Gar, a preposition, which is normally the beginning of a second um, part of the sentence. So I was sleepy oh. because, and then it would go on. So the, what's called the gar is how the thing ends. And so normally when you have a gar, you'd expect extra explanation. Yes. And so some people think that that, that, is, that is evidence that the, that the bottom half of Mark that would have initially contained an account of the resurrection was ripped away. That we kind of oh lost it. You, so the other thing, if you can imagine like a scroll and the like the the very edge of it is where the gospel ends or something, and it the, and the early manuscript it gets ripped off and then it's just lost. Now that's led to the fact that it seems like, and also the women are just terrified. That yeah. has led to what we think of in these, what what we have in verses nine to 20, which are like the greatest hits of the other gospels, right? Yes, that that yes. someone wrote endings to Mark to give it a proper ending. Yes. And so later manuscripts have this ending, early manuscripts don't. And we say early, man, like no early manuscripts have these endings. And so wow. um, what we have, are pretty confident of saying is that at some point later on, um, significantly later, people started adding an ending to Mark. Now, wow. I don't think that there's actually a missing ending of Mark. 
I you think, think he just Mark, leaves us hanging with because with with God? Well, I, I mean, that's just. I mean, I think that like sometimes I'm sorry, like sometimes you just break grammatical rules. Like, yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah. You end sentences on preposition. So, like, I think that that's interesting, but I don't think that that's probative. I, do too. I yeah. think that Mark's gospel is actually a very powerful ending because here's the thing. Let's be smart for a second. We're reading the gospel of Mark. We're reading the account of the women. So we know that the women aren't silent, right? Because like if right. they were silent, then they they would not be able to tell the story. And we're reading the story. But the story ends with the women being terrified and being terrified in the silence. And I think that is actually how the gospel wanted it to wanted it to end for the reader. In other words, we're very, we're very comfortable with this idea that, oh, Jesus is ri- risen from the dead. That's really good news. And now we can go in and spread the gospel. But nobody who actually becomes Christian, rem- we forget what it's actually like when we start to think that this stuff might be true. I don't know how, how you became a Christian, so I'm not going to do your business. But when you're sitting in church, and this uh-huh. like, you can even be a Christian when this happens, right? You're sitting in church yep. and the pastor's preaching to you. And you start feeling the spirit of God. And the first thing you're thinking is, oh, no, God is talking to me right now. I don't like this feeling. Yeah. Or when the path, like, why do you think when there's an invitation, people don't want to go up? There's a fear yeah. because there's a kind of comfort. And this is not me preaching. This is what's going on in Mark's gospel because Mark's gospel is a mystery, right? This kind of, yes. who is this guy? Who is this guy? The resurrection. So it ends with the resurrection as unsettling. And the resurrection is initially unsettling because the idea that dead people don't stay dead is a terrifying idea. Right. We want to know that the resurrection is true, but we don't want an angel stay showing up at our house. Like if, if an angel came to your house and said, Annie, I want you to like quit the podcast and uh-huh. I want you to become a traveling evangelist. <laughs> like you're so like, I don't scary. want you know, <laughs> scary. And yeah. so this idea that the women encounter a being. Right. Who tells them that the good news of Jesus is resurrection. And the first experience is abject terror. Yes. Alarm that is, is what actually, my version says. Alarm. Alarmed. Alarmed. Yeah. They said nothing because they are alarmed. Yeah. Some of us have become Christian and didn't tell anybody for a long time because we were afraid. Wow. Right? So this idea. Yeah. Is, so when Mark ends his gospel there, the resurrection happens. And they're terrified because the women understand the implications of this reality. The whole world is different. You as the reader are called to be unsettled by the resurrection. Yeah. You're called to allow the resurrection to terrify us. Yes. And what I mean by that is, and I want to, I want to make sure I I feel like I can't do it better than Mark did it because he did it the first time. But once we live in a world where God, we know for a fact that God intervenes and dead things don't stay dead. The entire plausibility structure of the universe is turned upside down. Yes. Listen, I think that, I think that like doctrine is really, I think people know me well enough to know that I think that doctrine is important, right? Yes. And they're like the differences that we have between Christians are like, these are real differences. Yes. But do you understand the worldview shift that you undergo when you shift from, I don't believe in resurrections to resurrections? Like that is, that is, that is a tremendous difference. And so this idea that you need to be unsettled by it, you need to ask yourself, do I believe in the resurrection? Because I mean, when we say something like that's impossible about anything, then it's a functional denial of the resurrection. Because the resurrection shows that God could do anything. Now, uh-huh. God may choose not to do it, right? So, and, and not saying like God may not do it, but there's nothing in our lives that God cannot do. Yes. And so the women, the women are terrified. And to leave it there would have been to leave us in tension. And we, nobody wants that. And I think because it ends with forcing you to deal with the resurrection. Let me give you an example that's a little bit less controversial. The Great Commission, right? Mm -hmm. So Matthew's gospel ends with go into the world, baptize everyone, you know, know, I'm with you at the end of the age, right? And Matthew just stops his gospel right there, Mm. right? But do you think that was the last thing Jesus actually said, right? In other words, Matthew does not say, and Jesus stopped talking. Matthew just stops his gospel. So the last thing that you hear from the lips of Jesus is 
the Great Commission. Mm. So in other words, he he kind of ends his his gospel on a close up on Jesus. So that and and then once again, Jesus is not just talking to the disciples, he's talking to you, the reader, and you're yeah. commissioned to go. And he's thinking, that's a good way to end the book. And you've been you've been this way, and you might have had one conclusion of whatever book you were written, and then you might get to the place you say, you know what? I think the book is done. Yes. Right. You got you get to this place to the writer, you say, you know what? This is the thought I want to end the book on. And I think in Mark's gospel, the idea that we need to let the resurrection unsettle us. And once we process the full reality of what the resurrection means, then like the women, we're ready to go and spread the good news because they go and tell. Wow. Yeah. Right? Because they, yeah. they go and tell because we're reading the gospel. And you imagine, yeah, right. and by the way, I'm not, and you think you got to think of these books as evangelistic tools, right? Mm-hmm. So eventually, the, these are books that are running around. I would love to be a preacher in the early church, and I ended, and the women were terrified, and I would stand up and go, "Hey, <laughs> are you scared? You ought to yeah. be scared, yeah, because you you've just entered a different world. What are you going to yeah. do?" So, in other words, the opportunity that Mark's gospel could have been an extended conversation on behalf of the performer. Even yeah. like begin to evangelize. So I, I think that there, so there's a good cool. enough theological sense to be made from the ending that we have that I don't think we need to posit another ending. Um, but I also think that what Matthew does is good too. Yeah. That Matthew kind of goes, you know, you guys go or even like yeah. John's addendum, right? They're like all fishing at the end of John's gospel. Yeah. And he's yeah. like handling some business there and Luke's yeah. gospel that it, well, Luke ends in Rome, basically, because he has a two-part yes. one. But this idea yes. that yes. the ascension and Pentecost. So I think that each gospel writer had an ending that each in their own way makes theological sense. And I think that that, that Mark's Ooh. gospel makes complete theological sense in its context. You're making Mark become my favorite gospel. I think this is going to happen with every episode. <laughs> that uh, that, that so, day, <laughs> that's going to become my favorite gospel. I love the idea yeah. of him leaving us in that tension and saying, like, what are you going to do with that? Like, so what? So, yes. yeah, they were afraid. They left. What are you going to do with that? I don't say, like, that's what I mean when I say it's a tightrope preaching. Yes. It, it, it depends on its rhetorical effect on its climax. And I think that he does it. In other words, I think that, that Mark lands the plan. And we've all yeah. had sermons that do that to us, right? We're going, we're going, right. we're going, we're going. Then he, he gets us at the end. But that's, a, right. that's, that's not easy to do. And that's why I think <laughs> as, a, as a literary work, Mark is it's a beautiful piece of literary work rhetoric because it, it it captures you and it brings you all the way to the end and then it leaves you like with this feeling right that, that yeah. something has happened to me in the reading of it um so i'm mark is actually it's funny because like i do the same thing i teach them uh-huh. and currently believe it or not my current ranking is okay. luke john mark matthew that's really? my current ranking but it switches. How often does it, it change? Well, Luke is Luke stays number one. He can't. Luke's he guy, you can't, yeah. you're not coming for Luke. Yeah. But I just taught John. I taught a, a full semester on John last okay. semester, and I was just with them. And so, anytime you spend time with John, you love him. It's actually one A and one B. So Luke and John are currently tied. Yeah. And then it's um, then Mark. it's Mark. <laughs> We yeah. maybe should have asked you which book you want to talk about versus me going like, yeah, y'all didn't ask me this. Fast, you, you just said, no. come on a podcast. I said, come on and please talk about Mark. Cause I was like, I love yeah. to me, Mark's the speed of Mark is so fun where he's just like, yeah. and then suddenly, and then suddenly, and then suddenly. And I, I so yeah. I was like, Oh, me and Esau will chop it up about that. Yeah, so <laughs> in the few, but I am going to get you to talk about Luke in just a second. But first, the, okay. one of the questions that came in is as we're reading okay. Mark, give us, yeah. One or two things to be thinking about. Like, what are the glasses we put on when we're reading Mark? What I want you to do is to try to be present in the story. And that may okay. seem to be a silly thing to say. No. But we know what we think is going on. I want to talk about this that I ain't going to talk about. I'll say it this way. So Mark 1 begins with um, Jesus and John the Baptist. And there's a yeah. quotation of um, Isaiah. And I'll say this, you can do this. This might be something you can do. When you go and you see an allusion to a text, go back and read the Old Testament text. Okay. Because in Isaiah, the one that's quoted to describe John's ministry, the person whom the prophet is preparing the way for is not the Messiah. It's actually the advent of God. Prepare the way of the Lord. 
every valley wow. will be lifted up um, and every mountain will be made low yeah. so that, you know, in the glory of the Lord will be revealed and, and we should all see it, or however the passage goes. So actually, Mark 1 gives you a huge, huge kind of, maybe there's more here going on that you might expect. Oh, such that wow. John is preparing the way for God. And so the idea that God might come amongst Israel is such an unimaginable thing that you probably couldn't necessarily just come out and say it. Yeah. But what would it look like if God were to visit his people and what God might be like? Wow. One of the things that's really interesting when you look at the Old Testament, you see things that, that God is going to do, rescue the oppressed, care for the widow and the orphan, that God's going to be the champion. He's going to, he's going to uh-huh. come and save his people. That is one thread that goes through the Old Testament. I myself will come and shepherd them. But there's also another thread that goes through the Old Testament that the king's going to come and do those things, right? That the king right. or the son of David sure. is going to come, he's going to rescue his people. Yes. So what happens if God comes in the form of the king to rescue his people? And so that as you see the narrative of Mark's unveiling, are you asking, is this simply the king or there's something more to this person? And allow that reality to develop as the plot develops, such that when Peter Jesus asked the question of Peter, we're asking who is he, and then when the when the centurion says truly, and the centurion doesn't know what he's saying, right? Yes. But when the centurion goes truly, this is the Son of God. Like, what are we supposed to think? And so to allow Jesus to shape our understanding of what it might look like for God to come amongst us and what it might look like for a king to come and save us. And the hard thing to do after all of that, right, is to kind of ingest this story. This is what I'm writing my book about. To ingest that story and then to live in that reality. Mm. In other words... Even, especially in Mark's gospel, in Matthew, you have ex- these extended teaching points, right? I'm not saying that yes. Mark doesn't teach, but Matthew has these, but, but Mark does it. But what does it mean to follow someone who lived the kind of life that Jesus lived? And how might I embody his way of being in my life? So Jesus thinks that sacrifice and love of enemies and it, it is the means by which we transform the world. Yeah. What does that mean for us? I think that Christians... We're constantly afraid. We're constantly worried as if we need power or influence to accomplish God's purposes. Mm. But what if, yeah. like Jesus, when we're weak is we're most dangerous? Wow. And so I want to say something like read the Gospels not simply as as a revelation of, of who Jesus is. That's, that's true. It's a revelation of who God is and a pattern of life that we have to follow after. And I ask myself, does my life at all look like someone who believes in that guy yes. as savior of the world? And I think that Jesus wow. is always challenging us and he's always challenging me. And and like every time I read the gospels, I'm constantly surprised. So I, it, it, may, it may seem hard to say this, but allow the gospel to surprise us again. Yes. Um, man, that's beautiful. That is that makes me excited to read Mark. That is really fun. I'm going to go back and read Mark too. I I got myself worked up. (laughs) Well, I can't let you go without you telling us a little bit about Luke. Like, don't leave. Luke's my favorite guy too. Why do you love Luke so much? Luke is what I like to call Old Testament saturated. Okay. And he, okay, actually, I'm going to, I'll give you, I'll give you, I'm going to tell you one scene from Luke that's just on my heart right now. And I'll give you like, this is, this is what I mean when Luke, Luke knows what he's doing, right? Yeah. So in Luke's gospel, in Luke's one and two, Jesus is born and then he comes into the temple, right? He comes into the temple and he sees Simeon. And mm-hmm. Simeon lifts up the baby and yes. he goes, This one is do except for the rising and the falling men in Israel. And then he has after that Anna, who also takes the baby to speak about the consolation of Israel. You have a man and a woman at the beginning of Luke's gospel proclaiming this person is the king of the world. You go through the entirety of Luke's gospel, and then you go into the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. In the book of Acts, in chapter, in in the first part of Acts, he makes a point to say the men are in the upper room, the the, the apostles. Then he says that Mary and the women are there with them too. So he kind of goes, 
men and women together, right? Uh-huh. And then Pentecost happens. Right? Yes. Pentecost happens. The Holy Spirit comes down. And then they go out. Everyone who was in the room of Pentecost goes out, and the men and women are out there proclaiming the gospel, the good news of God is in Christ. Luke makes this clear by how he structures the narratives, and he foreshadows it all the way in chapter one. Uh-huh. Right? And then they ask, cool. they ask him, what does this mean? What does this mean? They ask Peter, what does all of this mean? And in case you can't get what Luke is up to, he then quotes Joel. In the last days, I'll pour my spirit yes. upon all flesh. Your sons, and, your sons, and your daughters will prophesy. Yeah. So, what began in at the birth of the baby Jesus, uh-huh. men and women predicting that Jesus is the hope of the world, yes. climaxes at Pentecost, where the Spirit comes down, men and women together proclaiming the gospel, and they ask him, "What does it mean?" He says, "Just like the." The Old Testament, the whole narrative comes together. Just like yes. Jer- just like Joel prophesied that one day everyone's going to do it. It says your your, your maid service, your, like economic. So listen, when men and women, the rich and the poor, all are going to preach the gospel, right? Mm-hmm. And who's there at the at, at, at Pentecost? All of the nations represented through the different languages. Yes. yes. So Luke's gospel, right, tells the story of how God accomplishes purposes through men and women climaxing in a community of people united across race, gender, and economic status, men and women, young and old, rich and poor, mm-hmm. black and, well, not black and white, you know, ethnic groups in, in, in yes. the ancient world. Yes. That they were together proclaiming Jesus and they lived together yes. as a community. And that vision of life together um, under the sovereign rule of the king, trying to embody his compassion through how they treated one another yeah. is the most powerful telling of the Christian story that still caps in my imagination. That, and so that's not even to talk about the ways in which I don't want to steal who we're going to do, Luke. The way that Jesus, <laughs> the way that in Luke's gospel, God does the kind of stuff that God does. Yeah. So for example, that you're going to go say, so Elizabeth, right? Well, yes. Elizabeth is barren. Well, anybody who knows the Old Testament knows, oh, we know what God does with barren women. He kind of rescues them. Mm-hmm. Or he not rescues them. He gives them, he, he opens wombs. And so yes. what you see then in Luke's gospel is not proof texting, right? That yeah. here's the fulfillment of scripture. Here's God's consistency and character through time. He's the kind of God who does these kinds of things. Yeah. He's the kind of God who, who, who brings people together and those kinds of things. And so I just think that Luke's form of storytelling is, it's cute, right? Because you can read Luke's gospel a thousand times and not recognize that there's women at the beginning, men and women at the beginning talking about Jesus, and then men and women at the end talking about Jesus. But if you do get it, it enriches the narrative. Yeah. And so he does cute stuff like that all of the time. Yeah. So, sorry, this is my last. This is my last cute one. This is my last cute one. I love it. If you listen to Mary, this you listen to Mary's song. You go back and you read on um, what's called the Magnificat. Mary extensively cites Isaiah in the Magnificat. You get to the ministry of Jesus, even his first sermon. What is Jesus quoting? Isaiah. Yeah. So you have his mom being rooted in the in the Isaiah tradition, and then her baby boy grows up in its ministry is the embodiment of the Isianic tradition. And so there's all kinds of cute little connections like that if you're paying attention. And so I just find Luke like a great puzzle that I can never get all of the pieces together. But every time yeah. I discover another one, it gives me real joy. I always picture Luke is the one who interviewed Mary. Because he has so much from Mary. Like that line in Luke where it says she, after the shepherds told her who Jesus was, it says she treasured all this up in her heart. Yeah. And I'm like, she yeah. had to have told Luke. Who else how, so, who else knows yeah, all that? I think that Luke, I think that Luke definitely interviewed the um, the people. <gasps> okay. And, I, and right. I, th- I think there is something about a distance from the narrative that uh-huh. allows him to weigh sources. And to say, oh man, you know, like he, I, I, I've heard all of this stuff, and, and I think he, he, he's fundamentally like, okay, like Mark, you did a good job because he keeps the basic structure of Mark, right? Yes. With different elements, but he says, you know, there's more to this story, and I think that all of us as writers, there's something in us that compels us to put pen to paper, yeah. and I think that he had lived amongst Christians and heard enough stories of Jesus 
that he thought that he had something important to contribute, and he did so too. But I don't want to cook. Yeah. I don't want to steal all of the the, <laughs> the praise stealing. he has to You're do. Luke, he said, no, 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 it's not stealing. It's yes. giving us more. It is giving yes, us more. Yes. Luke and I mean, all of them. All of them are good. I need to, yeah. you know, I need to up my Matthew game because, like, as you can see, <laughs> I talk about to Luke a lot. I talk about Mark. <laughs> John, well, listen, we Matthew got Dr. Scott there, McKnight Monty. for Matthew, so we're going to be fine. Okay, then, Scott, his... Scott, Scott, Scott will get it. Scott will get it. Yeah, he loves Matthew. He, t- I mean, he, one of his little treats he gave us when he was on the first time is that the reason Matthew is the length it is is that he could fill up, Matthew would fill a page, and that would be it of that story. And then yeah. you just read it so different <laughs> when you look at it like that. Oh, it's just go. the best. He's not, thank you for doing this day. Will you close us out by just praying for us as we read Mark, sure. as we spend time in Mark? I, just mean I, will be hap- I will be happy to do so. God, please bless us to be surprised by the story of Jesus and challenged by the story of Jesus, encouraged by the story of Jesus. Give us the courage of the women to um, to see um, your to see in your son the hope of the world and to have the courage to share that news with yes. the world. So give it, bless us to make us missionaries um, in our own communities like these women became. We pray for you to keep us through whatever joys and sorrows we might be experiencing um, until all of our sorrows come to the conclusion of your second advent. Amen. Yes. Amen. Thank you, my friends. Oh, you guys, isn't he brilliant? Oh my gosh, so much mind blown emoji. Ugh. I am loving these conversations. Hey, come join us over on Let's Read the Gospels podcast. We are using the Let's Read the Gospels guided journal as we go. And you can join the guided journal book club over on Facebook. The link to that in the journal, of course, you know, they are in the show notes. And make sure you're following Dr. Esau McCauley. Tell him thank you so much for being on the show, how much you enjoyed learning from him today. If you have any follow-up questions from the episode, you can drop them in the Q&A box on your Spotify app if that's where you're listening like me. Or send them to us on Instagram at That Sounds Fun Podcast. And we love answering those for you as best we can. If you need anything else from me, you know I'm embarrassingly easy to find. Annie F. Downs on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, anywhere you may need me. That is where you can find me. And I think that's it for me today, friends. Go out or stay home. Do something that sounds fun to you. And I will do the same today. What sounds fun to me is going to the For King and Country premiere tonight of their movie Unsung Hero. Y'all, I cannot wait. And you know I'm wearing my pink suit from Easter. So y'all have a great week. We'll actually see you back here on Thursday with Joel and Luke from For King and Country. We'll see y'all then. That sounds fun. That sounds fun.